And welcome to another episode of History Obscura. As always, I am your host, Mandy Gardner. Have you ever wondered if there were such a thing as a peaceful and humble Roman emperor? Perhaps you've heard of the Antonines. These were, evidently, such emperors as I have described. Tonight I am pleased to read the story of the Antonines written by one Agnes Strickland and published in 1819. But first... Hello, my name is Eric Phillips and I host a true crime podcast called Find Me in the Dark along with my lifelong friend, Robert Prestige. We cover all things true crime from murder and kidnappings all the way to arson and mass shootings. You can find us on Spotify, Google, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Podbean, and bonus content on Patreon for as low as $5 a month. We look forward to talking crime with you, and thanks for listening. The Age of the Antonines The period of which I am going to speak is distinguished as the Age of the Antonines, that is, the age in which two virtuous emperors of that name bestowed peace and felicity over the world. The Romans being now masters of almost every inhabited country, the conduct of their rulers decided the fate of all other nations. Antoninus, surnamed the Pious, from his extraordinary merit, was chosen by Adrian to succeed him. He protected the Christians, declaring his resolution not to allow any sect to be harassed because of their religion. He was so generous that to relieve want and poverty he gave away even his private property, and said that when he became a public character he ought to have no private interests and possessions. He was mild yet firm, polished yet not luxurious. Antoninus became Emperor of Rome in the year 138. The power of Rome was at that time spread over a large portion of Europe and a great part of Asia and Africa. The Chinese indeed lived undisturbed except by domestic royals and were at this time in a high state of civilization. The petty princes occasionally quarreled among themselves, but they never invaded foreign nations nor did foreign nations invade them. The Tartars, their neighbors, were their only foes, and to keep them out of China, the ancient mode of raising a wall was adopted. This celebrated wall, though partially built before, was not completed until the year 214. The Chinese pretend to trace back their history to a very ancient date, the princes or kings of the small principalities seem to have early been ruled by one great chief or emperor. It has been said that the game of chess was invented, many years before the Christian era, by a Chinese general to amuse his troops during a long cessation of arms. Pray bear in mind that whilst Rome was flourishing, as queen of the European nations, the Chinese were existing in a state of wealth and refinement, and governing a very large portion of Asia. It is, however, generally thought that their knowledge was by no means equal to what they pretended to have been. The tribes of India were also at this time an ingenious people, and traced their origin to the highest antiquity. You remember that Sesostris had invaded some part of India, and that Alexander the Great had also visited the shores of the Ganges and conquered Porus, an Indian king. But these people continued to be governed by their own princes, and to enjoy their own peculiar laws, customs, and religion. Some of their princes, 
as I have already mentioned, sent ambassadors to Rome to offer congratulations to Trajan. Thus, China and India were almost as civilized and as learned in the age of the Antonines as they are now. You will find the history of these nations singularly amusing, and as for many centuries they subsisted apart from every European country, the accounts of them must be read in a separate form, as they do not mingle with other histories. So, to return to Antoninus Pius, it was a favorite saying of his that he had more pleasure in saving the life of one citizen than in destroying the lives of one thousand enemies. According to this doctrine, this most excellent of all the Roman emperors plainly proves that good sovereigns love peace better than war, and that nations possess most comfort and virtue in a period of tranquility. War may bring conquests and renown, but seldom, perhaps never, does it increase national prosperity. Defensive war is necessary and honorable. We ought to fight to protect our liberty and rights, but to fight merely for conquests and glory is never necessary and seldom honorable. Antoninus, according to the wishes of Adrian, had adopted Marcus Aurelius for his successor, and married him to his youngest daughter, Faustina. This good emperor died of a fever after 23 years peaceful reign, aged 75. Marcus Aurelius succeeded his father-in-law and took the name of Antoninus. He associated his brother Lucius Verus in the government with him. But Lucius was a most unworthy character, and disgraced the Roman name wherever he went. Fortunately, he died soon, and thus Marcus Aurelius became sole emperor. He was so learned that he is called in history Antoninus Philosophus, and he wrote a work entitled Meditations, which contains much excellent advice. He sold all his own plate and jewels to pay the expenses of a warlike expedition rather than burden his subjects with new taxes. His faults, for he had faults, consisted in his weak indulgence of his vicious brother, his worthless wife and foolish son. He was also apt to be proud of his learning and sometimes forgave faults which ought not to have been forgiven. For it is the duty of all men, more especially of kings and rulers, to check vice by punishing it, as well as to promote virtue by rewarding it. Avidius, a general of the emperors, strove to displace him and become emperor himself. Aurelius declared he would give up the empire without bloodshed if his abdication would prove beneficial for his people. But Avidius was slain by his own officers, and when his head was brought to Aurelius, he ordered it to be decently buried and behaved with great lenity to the rest of the rebels. When someone said Avidius would not have behaved so mercifully had he been conqueror, Aurelius simply replied, I never reigned so carelessly, nor served the gods so ill, as to fear that Avidius would ever be the conqueror. Aurelius was seized with the plague at Vienna, and died in the 59th year of his age, after a glorious reign of 19 years. He left a son, Commodus, who succeeded him, and desired that he might be taught that no wealth would satisfy a tyrant, and no guards defend him, that cruel princes never reign long, and that those in power must govern themselves because they have no one who has a right to govern them. Commodus did not profit either by his father's example or his father's precepts. He was as ignorant and contemptible as he was vicious and cruel and verified his father's words. 
For though he was so fearful of danger that he shaved himself lest his barber should use the razor to cut his throat, yet he was murdered in the thirty-first year of his age. Perhaps some of the faults of Commodus arose from his father's mildness and indulgence. It is the duty of parents to control their children, and those children who are wisely controlled and checked turned out the best and happiest men and women. Think of yourselves and your playfellows, and you will plainly see that pets and spoiled children are plagues to themselves and to all around them. Well, how very dare she! I'd like to show her a spoiled pet or two. Hmph. Best leave it there, friends. Do remember to leave us a rating or review or check out our Patreon page. Thank you. Good night. Mm -hmm.